Mighty Ape is Australia's entertainment and pop culture superstore with everything from movies, music, games, toys, books, hobbies and more. Mighty Ape is your one-stop shop for the things that matter most. They constantly have hot deals and exclusive promos. And if you visit their website on the click-through banner on fakechef.net's homepage, then your purchase will help support Good Movie Monday. Mighty Ape, Australia's entertainment and pop culture superstore. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. You mean to wish me a good morning? What do you mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not? Please go away. Let me speak for the love of God. Graboids and sky sharks. This is about as schlocky as the show can get, I think. <laughs> Hello and welcome to you. This is Good Movie Monday, the podcast presented by FakeChamp.net home of the Nerdy Cinematic Ramblings. My name is Glenn Cochran, and if I were a graboid, I think I'd be a shrieker. And uh, co-hosting beside me is our resident ass blaster, Ben Helwig. <laughs> What's up, mate? I, I believe you meant ass master. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if none of that made sense to you, then obviously you're not a Tremors fan, because of course, graboids, shriekers, and ass blasters come straight from the Tremors franchise. And today on the show, we are featuring an interview with the uh, series icon Michael Gross, who some of the older folk listening might recognise more as Stephen Keating, the lovable dad from Family Ties, which in turn, for millennials out there, was an excellent sitcom from the 1980s. <laughs> a, a fantastic sitcom, dude. We're practically educational. Yeah, and that show was too. I always wanted to be like Alex P. Keaton. He always got the hottest girlfriend. <laughs> it was all about Nick for me. Murray! Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he got to star in, was it My My Demon Lover? I think that's it. That's the one. I've got that on I've got that on laser disc. That's right, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. Laser disc. And also on this our second to last show for the year, we have a first for you, an interview with the director of Sky Sharks. And this is uh this is the first time Ben has had a crack at an interview. Yeah. I uh, was shitting myself the whole time. <laughs> well, so stick around and you can hear Ben shit bricks. <laughs> yeah, like literally. Like you can like I think halfway through the interview, uh I don't know if you edited the sound out, but there is literally audio of me making waste <laughs> during it. it was, uh, you know, no, it was great. It was, a, it was, a, it was, it was a lot of fun. I reckon we also have two of the best songs we've ever played on the show. Uh, and of course, I tell you this every single week, but you can find Good Movie Monday on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify. Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast from. And as of this week, you can also find us on the iHeart Radio Network, which isn't exactly easy to get on. So we're thrilled to be part of that. Download the iHeart Radio app and start listening to us that way. Your ears can help us climb their ranks and that would be good for us. But Ben, my old friend, stop the press, mate. Stop the press. There is only one way to kick off this episode. Mario Lopez is Colonel Sanders in a recipe for seduction. Premieres December 13th at noon. Only on Lifetime. Presented by Kentucky Fried Chicken. Mate. Mate. This, if this is not the best piece of marketing since Mac and Me, then it's got to be the best piece of marketing since Bye Bye Love. <laughs> I cannot wait. I honestly, I, I can tell. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, it's going to make my top 10 of the <laughs> films of the year. <laughs> the frustrating thing about this film which is called Recipe for Seduction, is the fact that um, it premieres right about the time this episode drops, so neither of us have really had a chance to watch it. <laughs> so we can only speculate that I, I reckon it's more or less an extended commercial, probably one of those parody shorts like Funny or Die or SNL. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's like another celebrity death. that They've just they've, they've waited to die and after we've recorded uh, <laughs> is how this episode is dropping. And uh, I'm very upset. I was one of the keen... Uh, followers of that news story that broke in New Zealand about that, you know, the, the real estate agent who was trying to, they've been trying to sell his house for four years and uh, uh, it, it weren't, weren't getting any offers. And then the, they, they brought on a new agent and he advertised that he sold it based on the fact that it was a two minute walk to a KFC, <laughs> it, like sold literally within hours. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the fact that there's a, uh, that there is a, a KFC movie with Mario Lopez playing the Colonel, I am I am a hundred percent down for that. I spent 
a lot of time there's a, a kfc in somewhere around the kind of coburg prestony uh, actually it's a bit close like a fairfield kind of area i'm not, on bell street there and it is it's the only kfc I've, I've been to where on the wall there they've got like the entire history of kfc I thought you were gonna. The, I thought you were gonna say the secrets to the herbs oh, and spices. The, the, they actually tell you what the twelve uh, secret herbs <laughs> and spices are. Uh, <laughs> no, they've got the they've got the full history on this kind of uh, mural, and they do. They even like they even openly admit that uh, the colonel uh, had major issues with K, the KFC brand after he had sold it because he felt that they had put profit yeah. first and uh, the food wasn't as good as it used to be and all this sort of stuff, mm-hmm. but. Uh, I spent a lot of I spent more time there reading that uh, <laughs> reading all that history stuff than I did uh, enjoying my uh, zinger stacker. I'm pretty sure that our our good friends over in Kentucky could probably tell us a whole lot about it. But uh, you know the beautiful thing about this Ben is, of course, that you and I have actually bonded over KFC. This movie might as well have been made about us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to. Uh, you'll have to. Um... You'll have to Photoshop the uh, poster and put our heads in there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, recipe for seduction. Uh, the show couldn't have gone on without a mention. And for the record, Kentucky Fried Chicken are not a sponsor. Although, with that being said, we... we yet. Won't, They're not a sponsor yet. We won't knock back their support. And in fact, we would literally knock back a bucket of original recipe right now. It's so nice, nice to feel. So good about a meal. So good about Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's so nice, nice to feel. So good about a meal. So good about Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's nice to feel so good about a meal. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, ben, uh, just before we move on, uh, some news on the Celebrity Death Watch. <laughs> uh, Friday afternoon, Tommy Tiny Lister passed away, which was a bit of a surprise. Yeah, a bit of a shock. I've just saw him on, uh, I've been looking at his videos on Cameo. All right. Uh, like just kind of like last week. And he looked like um, he was in good health? He, I mean, on those cameo videos, he looked, I mean, he looked like he was his age. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he was still, he was doing all these bits from Friday and stuff. I was kind of hoping for some more uh, Super Devil Juice. Give me that from uh, Little Nicky. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can't get, you can't get everything. Or the, some, some monobrow action from No Holds Barred uh, <laughs> when he played Zeus. That has made my day. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> That's what's it's one of my favorite scenes from. Uh, I mean, my favorite, absolute favorite scene from Little Nicky is that uh, where he turns Coke into a Pepsi, and the dog is he's like, "That's it, that's your evil. You turn Coke <laughs> into a Pepsi," and I'm like, "That's pretty. If you're a fan of Coke, that's pretty fucking evil." <laughs> that's right. There's only one place in the world where I think Pepsi outsells Coca Cola, and that's in Newfoundland. Wow. Yes. Is, is it because they're it's remote, right? I have no idea, but that's uh, that's you know useless information that I I don't know why that's in my my brain. It's like it's it's because they've only got subways there. That's the only <laughs> chain that's gone in there, so and they've got that Pepsi deal, and you can't buy Coke from them. <laughs> I love it. I love going. There's 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 nothing more I love than going into a fast food restaurant and uh, asking for a. I like, say, oh, I'll have you that meal and a Coke, please. And like, oh, we've got Pepsi. You know. Oh, I didn't ask for fucking Pepsi. If I wanted Pepsi, I would have said fucking Pepsi. <laughs> well, so far we've talked about KFC, Subway, and not much about movies at all. Um, <laughs> and now we've entered into the Coke versus Pepsi debate. <laughs> Coca Cola kid, let's tie it in. No, <laughs> I was. I last night, last night I found myself at a Coles at a no at a Woolworth shopping center, and by the register they had their uh, ice their drinks fridge, and they had uh, vanilla Coke there, but it was sugar-free vanilla coke oh fuck that 
what the what the hell <laughs> i mean that's a niche of a niche i love the fact that you censored yourself right after i said fuck yeah <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I, I dropped i dropped i dropped a bunch of fucks in the in the previous uh <laughs> little bit about about pepsi so i thought uh maybe I, maybe i'll reel it back speaking of lots of fucks um last week the godfather 3 director's cut got released on blu-ray the uh what's it called the, the coda mario Puzo's godfather coda the death of michael corleone i just wanted to mention it because uh godfather had a lot of references on this show back in the early days and um we, we were anticipating this release and i watched it um last week and it blew my mind dude it made a huge difference to the film have, have you had a chance to see it no, not yet. I have to be honest. I have to admit, I have not. I've never seen Godfather Part Three. I yep. just heard so many, so many bad things, and I was like, you know what? I'm quite happy to leave it at number two. Yeah, which I, you know, which I really like, especially the De Niro stuff in Part Two, all yes. the Bruno Kirby and um, you know all the flashback stuff. Well, I mean, this is not just a cheap cash in because it's been on record for over twenty years that this you know, n- number three was not the film that he intended to make, and the title they've gone with here was the original title that the studio knocked back. But the recut. I was going to say that. Yeah. How did how did this happen? Like at, at that stage, he was Francis Ford Coppola. Godfather Part One and Two were huge hits, so surely he would have had enough juice at the time to make whatever the hell he wanted you would think so but apparently there was a lot of interference and i think it probably stemmed from the title the studio didn't agree with the title one they thought it might have been a spoiler they also might have thought people were confused what does godfather coda even mean and um i don't maybe movie girls just weren't as sophisticated but now that he's done his other director's cuts of cotton club and apocalypse now for the third time uh he's got i I only found out about i only found out about the cotton club one uh like like the other day and i was like really <laughs> yeah. cotton club somebody gave him money to recut cotton club like don't get me wrong you know that and big i remember liking that and the big town but uh you know on video i've never I've, but since then i've never thought about it yeah. it's never you know it's not that when people talk about francis ford coppola cotton the cotton club is not the movie that immediately springs to mind well look if anybody is thinking about you know contemplating whether they should buy the new godfather cut uh definitely do i know i do have a bit of a reputation for loving bad sequels but in this case <laughs> in, in this case it is a drastically uh a drastic improvement on the original and uh, i de- definitely recommend it i mean the structure of the film has changed certain characters are chopped down others are given more like time Sophia Coppola? yeah she, she's uh... she's definitely reduced in screen time um right. uh connie um talia shire's character has a lot more weight in the film as does um chaz palmateri's character yeah it's just worth worth the, worth the money but anyway uh how about this disney reveal did you read about the disney stuff last friday no not at all had no idea you know until you told me before we came on air <laughs> didn't didn't know there was any <laughs> here's here's the pulse and here is my fingers shoved all the way up my ass. I have no idea what's going on. Uh, good, good movie Monday, everybody. Your premier source of movie, movie news. Movie news. I literally just I sit there staring at a at a at a switched off computer monitor and just go. Ah, end of the day. Well, like uh, no idea. I'm sure it's no secret to most people out there. Disney have made a huge reveal, one of the biggest ever, uh, and there's so much new stuff coming from them, including Star Wars, Marvel, lots of spin-offs from classic Disney animated films. Um, we're not huge fans. I know I can speak for myself of, of Disney and Marvel and that kind of stuff. However, I reckon um, if you want to hear us talk about it, tune into our Tuesday night video, which would be tomorrow night, and um, we'll, we'll see what we can do. See how we can flesh out that conversation, Ben. That should be interesting. Yeah, I don't. I don't mind. I don't mind any of those, any of those things. I used to work in a comic shop. Like I like all that stuff. So excellent. Uh, all right. Yeah. So let's just let's just slate that for Tuesday. And um, before we move to Jarrett, because he's he's anxiously waiting in the wings. In case you don't know, um, banging on the door, wondering how Monster Fest went last week. Yeah, it went really well. Yeah, wrapped up on Thursday. Um, yeah, it was good. The last. I think the last two days, the uh, res- restrictions lifted even more. So we were able to get more people in the cinema, uh, which is fantastic. Because prior to that, I think a sellout session was 60 people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was fantastic. But uh, yeah, I think everyone had a great time and uh, enjoyed all the movies we played. 
uh, particularly things like Psycho Gorman and um, I think he, you know Santa Claus made a surprise visit on uh, closing night, which uh, everybody <laughs> loved. Excellent. Um, you know, it was uh, yeah, it was great. Was um was like Santa Claus a bit of an ass blaster? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> he kept he kept wanting people to sit on his knee while he was standing up. It was very it was very odd. Was he found passed out? Was he found passed out in hallways? He got into the moon dog. I tell you what. <laughs> he got into the moon dog and it it was it was warm and I don't think he'd had lunch. So uh <laughs> So Santa was a bit lightheaded, well, a, bit, by... uh, a bit grabby. <laughs> <laughs> well, by all looks of it, uh, Monster Fest did seem like a well-oiled machine from what I could see. So I'm glad it went well. Um, but the other guy who does the hard yards with you at Monster Fest is Jarrett. And uh, he's got a bunch of new releases to talk about. So for the final PE class of 2020, here's Jarrett. Hey, this is Jarrett. Welcome to PE class, the final PE class for 2020. And we're going to see out this year with a week of quality releases. That's right. So let's kick it off with Roadshow. And coming out on DVD, Care of Rialto Distribution via Roadshow, is Becky. Now, this is the uh, home invasion thriller horror that stars Kevin James, funny man Kevin James. And I say the term funny man loosely because I've never found him funny and I've gone out of my way to pretty much avoid everything this guy has done. But he transforms himself in this one from the King of Queens to the King of Screams. And it's good value as he plays an escape prisoner who squares off with like an 11-year-old girl named Becky. Then moving on to probably the most exciting release this week, undoubtedly the most exciting release of this week, is Christopher Nolan's Tenant. It's coming out on 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray and DVD. The 4K Ultra HD set is in fact a three-disc set and features an hour-long documentary, pretty extensive documentary titled Looking at the World in a New Way, The Making of Tenant. This is the sole special feature on the 4K Ultra HD and Blu-ray. Unfortunately, there's nothing else, but you can't help but feel that Warner will double dip down the track, and rightfully so, because this film was actually pretty good. I saw it theatrically a couple weeks ago, went in with low expectations and came out having a fantastic time with it. John David Washington turns in another fantastic performance, and it's probably the first film that I've seen Rob Pat in that I've actually thought he was really good in. So Tenet comes with super recommendation from me. You've got to see it, and I'll be picking up on 4K Ultra HD. Then coming out from Universal Sony Pictures Home Entertainment, on DVD and Blu-ray, they've got a sci-fi film with Theo James and Stacey Martin called Archive. This is a DTV uh, vehicle. Then moving on to another title that's coming out However, only on DVD. It's a documentary titled Audrey, directed by Helena Cohen. Uh, and it's a documentary on Audrey Hepburn. Then they've got Broken Hearts Club coming out on DVD only, a rom-com that had a brief theatrical window also. Then there's another adaptation of Francis Hodgson Burnett's classic tale, The Secret Card. And that's right, this one also had a theatrical release, but blink and you would have missed it. It's got Colin Firth and Julie Walters in it. Then on the one I guess that Glenn's going to be most excited about, I mean... He's even got one of the cast members on this episode talking about this film is Tremors Shrieker Island. Now, this is what? I think the seventh entry in this franchise. And it's pretty much been a DTV franchise. The only film that got a theatrical release was the first film. And it's in fact the 30th anniversary of the first film this year as well. So it seems kind of timely that the seventh film comes out. Then coming out from Paramount via Universal Sony Pictures Home Entertainment is a huge backlog of... Miramax and Dimension titles. Um, very few of them making their way to Blu-ray. I think it's only two SKUs from memory. It might be like Sin City and God, The Crow, I think. The rest are only coming out on DVD. And I'm not... I, look, should I go through them? I mean, it's the last one I'm going to do for the year, so I'll just... I'll run through them. There's Sling Blade, Sin City, Cold Mountain, Gone Baby Gone, Chicago, Shall We Dance, Finding Neverland with Ben and uh, Glenn's favourite actor, Johnny Depp, should I say, who is a perfect Grindelwald. Uh, fuck you guys. Uh, then there's Goodwill Hunting, The Talent of Mr. Ripley, The Crow from Dusseldorn, Chasing Amy, and The Scream Quadrilogy. So a lot of these titles have been previously available either through Roadshow or through uh, Buena Vista Disney, and now they're just resurfacing via Paramount through Universal Sony Pictures Home Entertainment. It'd be great if they started mining the titles that actually haven't had a local release yet, but instead, I guess the key popular titles, they're putting them back in stores and around Christmas, so... You know, people have got things to watch over the holiday season. Anyway, that's it for me for this year. So until 2021, 
stay physical. And I reckon a few of those will be going home with me this week. Uh, thanks to Jarrett. Good stuff as always. And Ben, in a few minutes, we're going to uh, run my interview with Michael Gross. And then a little later on, you'll be interviewing the director of Sky Sharks, uh, Mark Fahees. Is that how you pronounce his name? Mark Fahees? Uh, uh, I believe he said it's uh, uh, Fieser. 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 Wow. I was way it's, off. It's, he said in German, it's Fieser. He said a lot of Americans uh, say Fizi. Okay. That's my rewind sound effect. <laughs> and then a little later on, you'll be interviewing the director of Sky Sharks, Mark Feasy. Yes. <laughs> yes, I will be. Um, and it could be argued that neither of those movies really existed without the influence of Jaws, which throughout the decades turned imitators into mockbusters and has essentially gifted us with an entire sharkish subgenre. So do you want to maybe spend the next few moments discussing some of the standout B-movie creature features that align with the Tremors or Sky Sharks brand of film. Let's do it. All right, maybe I'll get the ball oh, actually, rolling. Actually, no. No, I don't. <laughs> no. Damn you, you've foiled my plans. Let's talk about Hallmark movies. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll get the ball rolling. I've got two. Um, one of them's actually a Monster Pictures release. It's kind of a Tremors, Lovecraftian ode. How good is Grabbers? Ah, uh, Grabbers. Yeah, no, Grabbers is great. I was I was worried that you're going to talk about like Dead Sea or something. I was like, that's one we'd rather forget. <laughs> you didn't even have to say that. No. <laughs> no, but Grabbers is fantastic. Grabbers is it a really good movie. It is a great movie. Uh, if you've never seen it, it's, a, it's an alien invasion movie whereby the aliens are huge tentacles or tentacle-like creatures and the only way to survive is to have a high alcohol content level in your body. Uh, yeah, they don't and, like the booze and it's set in Ireland, so uh, they're yeah. fine. And these characters lock themselves down in the pub, get shit-faced, and it is hilarious. It's also really clever. And I reckon if you like movies like Shaun of the Dead, then then you should hit this one up because it kind of flew under the radar. Definitely. And we released it on DVD and Blu-ray, and uh, I believe it's still available from JB Hi-Fi. It's available from the Monster website. It is indeed available from the Monster website, and I'm sure you'll be able to find it on, on eBay because I know they sell there as well. So I thought that one was definitely worth mentioning. Very Tremors-like. But in terms of schlocky shark movies, this one's a bit tricky because I love things like the Mega Shark movies that the Asylum released. Yeah, right. <laughs> Mega but, Shark versus Giant Octopus. And, and yeah, and um, Crocosaurus or whatever, you know, all that all yeah. that stuff. Mecha Shark. Um, and also no, notable mention to Swamp Shark starring Kirsty Swanson and Robert Davey. I think that's kind of fun. Yeah, <laughs> which is uh, it's very similar to the one I'm gonna. I was gonna talk about, but uh, yeah, go keep going. Cool. Well, the one I'm going to recommend is actually a little bit different. It's called Frankenfish, uh, which I think I've spoken about on the show before, but I can't quite remember. But I'm gonna do it again. It's from 2004, directed by Mark Dippy, who directed Spawn, and he also directed The Reef Two and a bunch of animated films like Boxcar Children and a few Garfield movies. But it's great. It stars uh, Tori Kittles, who's from Dragged Across Concrete, Thomas Arena from um, Dark Knight Rises, a whole lot of other people, including Richard Edson from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And it's pretty much the generic trapped and surrounded trope takes place in a swamp with an oversized frankenfish uh, tormenting them. And a frankenfish is a real thing. I had no idea. It's a, it's a fish with a snake's head. That, that's real? Yes, a Frankenfish. It's a it's a fish with a snake head. You can look it up on Google. Obviously, for the movie, they've ramped it up and made it look like you know really horrendous and monstrous. So if you like movies like Anaconda and Rogue and Piranha, then you put them together, you get Frankenfish. Right. Well, you know, look. I mean, as as uh, I don't know if it I don't know if it if it's um, in the final cut of the interview because uh, I gave editing. Uh, editing duties i handed them over to you but uh, <laughs> in my interview with mark uh, fisa he does talk about how like sky sharks are like real, we're I, le real. I left it in my friend yeah oh, excellent yeah i love that i mean i'm not going to give too much away um but firstly stick around for it it's the funniest interview i think i've ever heard in my life <laughs> but he, he, yeah like he, he starts by saying that they're real but then he elaborates that they just put the shark skin on the planes on the plane, yeah. Because <laughs> it's more aerodynamic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what have you got there? What What's one that you think is worth talking about? Uh, well, look, I was... <laughs> my my goal was to talk about the Shark and Saw Women's Prison Massacre, <laughs> uh, which was directed by uh, the legend himself, Jim Wynorski. Of course it was. And stars Tracy Lords, uh, <laughs> among, among others. And it's basically a... Um, 
it is like these <laughs> these women escape from the local women's prison uh but a local fracking operation has miraculously uh, accidentally gone like too far and has opened up a channel to the center <laughs> of the earth uh or the center like the yep kind of the center of the earth kind of like it, and somehow like, a subterranean the, like, domain a, a subterranean well a subterranean part of the ocean yeah. that's literally under the um the kind of earth in in arkansas and that's kind of what they did when they uh they made the piranha 3d that's how they uh went with their story too yeah too, and it's and the meg it's yes basically the same thing as the as the meg and yeah the piranha movies which i do <laughs> piranha 3d and 3 double d are both brilliant films um <laughs> i agree but so these these sharks that can they come up in the arkansas swamp and uh you know and can like <laughs> Like sand sharks, they can uh, swim under the earth uh, because they're just that awesome and uh, tear people up. And they, these, I think these four, these four um, female prisoners escape from the from uh, the local prison. And uh, I'm not sure. I'm actually I'm not 100 percent sure, sure what Tracy Lord was doing there because basically what happened was I I popped it on, but um, the when I was watching it, it was the day after Monster Fest had finished. Uh, so I I was awake for maybe the first 20 minutes of that film and then i was literally asleep on the couch <laughs> while it was playing <laughs> so I, i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure what happens in the end well didn't you but, didn't uh, you be, didn't you start this by saying i was going to talk about that movie i was going to talk about it and i and i have it does start dominique swain which i and she is really let me say uh come come a long way since her, <laughs> her days in movies she, like she, she must have been really young when this one came out no, no, quite the opposite, in fact, because this this is like a, this is a this is a this is a, a recent Jim Wynorski movie, like oh, I wow. believe, like 2016 or something like that. That's um, amazing. Let me. Uh, I know I about have... I know about the film, but why does my brain tell me that it's older? Because uh, you know, yeah, it was 2015. Uh, yeah. Because Jim Wynorski. I mean, was only making good films in the 80s and uh, early 90s. Uh, once video kind of came in, uh, the the career went off the rails and he started making things like, you know, the Bear Wench oh, that's project right. and uh, or <laughs> yeah. the Bear Witch, the Bear Witch project <laughs> and stuff like that. And if you watch that doco Popotopolis where he goes into the, uh, he goes into the camera wet, into the equipment hire place. And he's like, it's like, hmm. I've got enough money in the budget to have another pair of boobs in the movie or some lights. I think I'm going to take the boobs. And it, it, it explains a lot when you watch those, those films and you can't, it was like, it's great. They're full of boobs. I can't see any of them, but uh, you know. <laughs> and did you, did you actually have another one to talk about? Given that you don't want to talk, given that you don't want to talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I will just, I'll just give a shout out to, um, to bait. Slash bait 3D was a was a yeah. one of the uh, more enjoyable uh, giant shark movies uh, that w- was made here in Australia, mm-hmm. uh, directed by uh, the legendary uh, Kimball Rendell, uh, the man behind Cut Australia's. Uh, Who was on the show earlier in the year? You made uh, uh, yeah, Cut the uh, the what was the name of the villain in Cut? He's like a film head or something like that. What was his? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember his name. It's not tape head. Cellular head. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is a, is a fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed that film as well with uh, Kylie Minogue playing a, a a great character in that. But he's also a member of the Hoodoo Gurus and mm-hmm. and uh, stuff like that. He's a and he's a real, he's a super nice guy. Uh, uh, and Bait is great. Like Bait, is, it's a shopping center shark movie. It's a fun so movie. This, you know, this during a flood, during a, a flood, these uh, people get trapped in a in a Coles yeah. or a, like a Woolworth type thing or Richie's and uh, you know, the place floods and uh, sharks get loose <laughs> or a shark gets loose and, you know, stalks all of the people who are like trying to survive on the top of their shelves. You would think that, you know, they're literally in a supermarket. So they've got plenty of food. They're on the food shelves. They can just hang out until the water receded. Yep. But no, nah. they're desperate to get out. And uh, so they put themselves <laughs> in, incredibly risky situations to do it uh yeah it stars uh shani vincent from home and away and uh the patrick remake <laughs> yep and uh i'm trying to think of uh well, 
I've got a funny story for you with Bates 3D. So it was reviewed on at the movies with Margaret Pomerantz and David Stratton. And David went first and David like, you know, gave it one star or something. It might have even been half a star. But then Margaret comes in and she gives it a review. And then right at the end of the review, she said, a disclaimer, um, my son is best friends with the director, four stars. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. And one more before we go on. Uh, look, I think I have talked about it on the on the show before, but uh, look, if we're going to talk about giant tentacle movies, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the phenomenal Stephen Summers Deep Rising uh, <laughs> film with uh, with Good Movie Monday favorite Treat Williams <laughs> at the at the lead with uh, Fumka Johnson and Wes Studi and uh, Jason Fleming, I believe. Uh, pops up uh it's a fa- it's, you know set aboard a cruise liner that uh, heads it gets caught in a storm and some <laughs> giant like apparently a thing that's real and uh, i'm pretty sure like i've I, I spent i spent um a couple of uh a couple of weeks uh, a year in in korea for about five years in in south korea and uh in one of the port cities busan and by the beach they've got this massive fish market and you kind of walk and there's like stuff that I had never seen before. And they, every second stall has a fish tank full of those, the creatures from <laughs> the deep rising, just, just very small versions of it. And it is like, it is quite confronting. <laughs> Mate, <laughs> like, I tell oh. you what, you and Joe from Bonehead Weekly, um, you're, you're destined for each other, mate, because he talks about that movie all the fucking time. Uh, <laughs> I'm beginning to think that is your recipe for seduction. <laughs> we need to, you know what song we need to play on this show i know you've uh you've uh already plotted them out but we need to uh the sound of seduction by Pornland the band that uh because that i think that sums up joe and my uh, relationship it's heavy on the bass it's a it's a, a classic song What's going on everybody? Happy to be back on Good Movie Monday for the final episode of 2020. And I don't think I'm alone when saying 2020 can piss off already. I got quite a bit to cover so let's do this in high speed format. Cameras have started rolling on Mad Max Fury Road director George Miller's next film. Idris Elba and Tilda Swinton starring fantasy romance drama titled 3000 Years of Longing has filming underway in Australia with a production based in Sydney. Delivery is reportedly set for September 2021. The plot details are being kept under wraps, although a plot description has been floating around and reads as follows. A lonely and bitter British woman discovers an ancient bottle while on a trip to Istanbul and unleashes a genie who offers her three wishes. Filled with apathy, she is unable to come up with one until his stories spark in her a desire to be loved. The third Tom Holland starring Spider-Man movie could very well see him meeting Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield Spider-Man. A number of outlets have been reporting that Garfield is set to return to Spider-Man while Maguire is currently in negotiations with Sony and Marvel. Furthermore, Kristen Dunst will reportedly be back as Mary Jane Watson and Emma Stone, pregnancy permitting, will be reprising her role as Gwen Stacy. On top of all that, another previous Spider-Man villain is joining Electro's previously reported return with Jamie Foxx back in the role. Alfred Molina will be back as Dr. Otto Octavius, aka Dr. Octopus, the role he took on in Sam Raimi's 2004 Spider-Man 2. The planned Metal Gear Solid movie, which has been in the works at Sony for years and years now, finally has its star. Oscar Isaac has signed on to play Solid Snake, the lead character from the Metal Gear Solid video game created by Hideo Kojima. On board to direct the film is Jordan Vogt Roberts, who directed monster film Kong Skull Island and the coming of age film The Kings of Summer. You can expect Vogt Roberts is raring to get this thing going, he's been attached to the project since 2014. Although there's no official word on when cameras will be rolling, having Isaac on board is a big sign that the project's moving into Sony's high priority list. The Fantastic Four are finally heading into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that's right, a new Fantastic Four film is on the way and it's going to be coming from director John Watts who directed Spider-Man Homecoming, Spider-Man Far From Home and the aforementioned next Spider-Man movie. The long gestating Indiana Jones 5 is finally going to start filming, it's going to film in the US in spring and we have confirmation that Harrison Ford will indeed be returning as the famed archaeologist. The film is going to be directed by James Mangold, known for Logan, Ford v Ferrari and Walk the Lion amongst others. As of now, Indiana Jones 5 is scheduled for US release on July 2022. 
And Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman 1984 director Patty Jenkins has signed up to direct the new Star Wars movie. There aren't any plot details available as of now, but we do know the film's title, Star Wars Rogue Squadron. The new Star Wars film is scheduled for Christmas 2023. And finally, George Clooney will be directing Ben Affleck in his next film. Affleck has entered negotiations to star in The Tender Bar, an Amazon Studios film with Clooney helming. The film is to be based on J.R. Moringa's memoir about growing up in Long Island, seeking out father figures among the patrons at his uncle's bar. No word as of yet if Clooney will also be starring. We also had some reviews go up on ScreenRealm.com, among them David Fincher's Mank, which was reviewed by Glenn who gave it 5 stars, calling it absolutely exceptional, but pointing out that it's not going to be for everyone. And I reviewed The Crudes A New Age, 3.5 stars out of 5, I called it a pleasant, undemanding sequel that family should enjoy. That's it for me guys, thanks so much for having me, ScreenRealm.com as always. Oh, before I go, thanks to Eagle Entertainment, we're giving away DVD copies of the South African horror film, The Soul Collector. So be sure to jump on ScreenRealm.com for the competitions and all the good screen stuff. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, etc, etc. Thanks so much for having me, I'm out. You don't know what you're up against. I got this handled. You got a genetically enhanced giant carnivorous worm with tunneling abilities loose on your private island. This species should be left to die. What exactly are we talking about? Freakers. We have 48 hours to stop these things. Let's go, Ramboy. Burt Gummer. He's a freaking legend. Let's go. Got me in. She's culling the weakest from the herd first. Crap, that means I'm next. Welcome to the party, Bird. It has to end here. This is it. Lead, follow, or get out of my way. I'll lead. That's not an option. It's a real thrill for me to be speaking with you because I am an unabashed Tremors fan. Oh, good. I'm glad. You've seen all of them, uh, Glenn, or most of them? I own all of them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> including well, the tv series here comes number seven right down the pike well that was the first thing i was going to say off off the top is congratulations on another fantastic super fun installment i don't know how it's possible for a part seven to be this good oh i'm so glad you enjoy it, it, oh, it good, good. I'm, 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 I'm so glad are you amazed at how long the franchise has lasted absolutely absolutely uh i um I, I didn't. I didn't imagine this. Uh, I. Um, I. I did know it was a, a good product and an unusual product. But uh, being the fatalist that I am, I never assumed that it's going to, you know, going to work this quite this long. Uh, I'm thrilled for that reason because Bird is a character I love um, revisiting from time to time. I. I don't particularly like. Um, Steady work. I love the variety of freelancing, which is the reason why I've only done one one sitcom in, in all, all my forty five year career. Uh, I've been uh, recurring characters on other sitcoms, but I've never been part of the permanent cast except for one seven year stint on Family Ties. I like variety, and but uh, now I've done Bert for seven years, but I revisit him every couple of years which means that it's always refreshing to see him again. Um, had, I, had, I, had I to be with Bert every day, I don't know that I could take it. <laughs> uh, he's, he's, quite a, he's quite a character. Once upon a, once upon a time, there was a there was hint of, uh, uh, there was talk of, uh, of a, doing a series with Bert. You know, uh, Bert's, you know, so they were tossing around uh, ideas like Bert's basement, you know, his, his basement compound, things mm-hmm. like this. And um, I always felt that, that, that Bert, it's fun, funnily enough, he's, he's become a, a kind of uh, head of the franchise in a certain way, if, if only because he survived, uh, keeps surviving. But um, I always thought he shouldn't be the focus in a funny way. But he, he was always an ancillary character and that uh, uh, he he he's only interesting the more the more normal human beings you surround him with you know if you know what I mean uh, because he's so queer and strange and uh, <laughs> that uh, by contrast he's he, the funnier he is by contrast if you surround him with the normal human beings and so uh, 
the quest in all these pieces is to not center it on Bert, but always have sidekicks or more normal people who can look at him like the crazy person he is and be astounded at the things that come out of his mouth. So, um, so that's what's always fun about Bert. Uh, Bert, I never wanted to do a series about Bert. You know, he always he seems to work best if somebody else is taking the helm, and Bert just wanders in and out and does strange things. <laughs> yeah, well, he has become like such an iconic figure over the years, and given that his personality, I guess, is attributed mostly to your performance, are you involved in tweaking the scripts when they come along to get that dialogue and direction just right for you? I, I. I am. I am. There's certain things that uh, over time that have, I've quite. Uh, I'll give you, give you one example. In one of the films, um, somebody asked me to say a line which was patently false. It was. It was. A, it was about natural. It was about some, some natural history. I think it was about bees or something. When somebody had said uh, uh, the um, the the drone protects the hive for something like this, the beehive, and it was like they were talking about uh, miniature graboids and how they compared them to bees and said the drone com- uh, the drone defends the hive. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not true. <laughs> and somebody said, well, they said, I said, the drone has one one thing to do, and that's inseminate the queen, and then the drone dies. The worker bees and the soldiers defend and this person, you know, we have this huge argument on the set. This person wanted me to say that the drone defended the hive. And I said, Bert, first of all, he does his homework. He would never, he never says, he, he does his homework thoroughly. If he says something, it's true. It's true. He, 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 he researches every fact. And I said, this is something you must know about Bert. So I, I become over time. So I, I won that. I said, I, I will not say that line. I can't do that. It was one of something I'd missed in the, uh, in the rewrites. It was a late rewrite of, about these bees. And I said, I can't say that line because it's technically untrue. And Bert would not say it untrue because he always says his homework. So, um, I forget what we substituted for it, but I, I over time I've become a sort of, I consider myself a defender of Bert, uh, mm. a, a kind of uh, uh, his his lawyer, if you will, his defender in court, uh, uh, and the way he might express myself. Somebody asked me that what I do an interview, and uh, uh, when I do an interview and play Bert in the interview, and I said I will not do that. I said because Bert requires a little thought on my. He expresses himself in a very specific way. Um, it's very often technical, and I said I don't have that expertise, so I have to I have to do the research before I say something that Bert would say. So um, it's interesting. I've become a kind of an advocate for him over time, and so they they're very kind about letting me look over dialogue and say, you know, I think Bert would say it differently. Um, I, Bert would put a twist on it, uh, and there's there's a piece of dialogue I won't tell you what. Uh, in 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 Tremors Seven that I I loathe. I, it was a, it was a it was a, 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 a an argument I lost, and it was too late to change it. And but it, a piece that I absolutely hated saying, and as a result, we had to do a number of takes because I kept forgetting it yeah. because I just felt this is this is terribly wrong. This is this is the wrong line. Bert would not say this, and so I had to do a number of takes because it wouldn't stick in my head. <laughs> particularly love uh, for the previous film called Day in Hell when you did those short sort of 30 second TV spots or you know to promote the, <laughs> the survival guide stuff was hilarious oh yeah yeah that was yeah this wonderful director uh, uh, Don Michael Paul who's done uh, five six and seven I think deserves a lot of credit for these these wonderful ideas and those survival things are are fun and uh, <laughs> we've actually uh, we've actually written something uh, you can talk to Rebecca about up soon. I'm not going to tell you the title of it, but we have done eight episodes, which will soon be uh, be on YouTube. But uh, very much tied into uh, uh, America right now and what it's going through in the elections and stuff like that. <laughs> and Bert, of course, always has 
Turn it off with that advice. So we have two, or th- two, uh, eight, two or three minute pieces, which are soon going to air on video, on uh, YouTube, I believe, and I think they're going to be a lot of fun. We've just, I wrote six of those, six of the, seven of those eight, and so it was really time to have a good deal of fun with Bert. Oh, I can't wait to see those. They, uh, they amuse me to no end. And and Don Michael Paul is one of my favorite directors as well. Oh, great, great. Yes, well, I, I, he's he's just wonderful, and he, you know, we it's 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 very tough and very demanding work, and uh, you know, small budgets and, and and little time, and he does as good a job as anybody I can imagine. And um, uh, yeah, so so yeah, I love him. He's so- great. So something I wanted to touch upon before we um before we wrap up is the cast in this one's incredible. You've got Richard Brake, um, Caroline uh, Langrish, uh, Jackie Cruz, and John Heater. Did you feel a renewed sort of integrity with them on board? It felt almost to me like it was a return to the original film as far as the ensemble is concerned. Well, you know, the, you know I, I love that mixed ensemble. We've always had sort of mixed mixed race ethnic backgrounds in the ensemble you know you, Miguel in the first uh, the first tremors uh, uh, Caroline Langrish I absolutely loved her Richard Gray was a was a doll boy what he had to go through in this thing you've, you've seen the film I take it oh yes have you seen it yes oh okay so the I, I haven't seen it yet to be honest with you uh, because I resist watching myself on screen but um, Richard I could just remember the days we had and how many times he had take a dunk in the water and how just how uh, how kind he was as we were both on that uh, crazy uh, reeling uh, suspension bridge we worked on for uh, for an entire day and uh, he was just a good sport I enjoyed him immensely Caroline was was a real doll uh, uh, I loved her enormously and um, so you know and Jackie Cruz John Heater marvelous I had I so loved Napoleon Dynamite, and uh, uh, John was just uh, uh, full of uh, great ideas. And can we try this? Or can we try that? And uh, he, he was just lovely. So uh, um, you know, I am renewed by the people with whom I work. It's that simple. You know, Bert. Uh, uh, Bert is Bert Gummer, but what's always interesting is to surround. Is to surround uh, himself with uh, a new crop of fascinating people and talented people, and that just uh, that brings new blood to me. It, it inspires me. So um, I, I couldn't be happier with this with this latest bunch. Uh, I keep getting asked, "Would you would you like to be with Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward and Reba McIntyre and all the rest again?" And, and the answer is yes. They were wonderful. Uh, but uh, I'm the only one who seems to have survived from that first film. Um, none of the other of them wanted to, wanted to return, with the exception of Fred in, in Tremors 2. And um, I have become the, uh, the leader, if you will, only because I've survived when the rest of them have dropped away. Uh, so I would have loved to have uh, uh, played uh, second banana uh, to uh, Kevin Bacon and all of that, but... Um, the rest of them sort of over time said, no, I've had enough. I'm so fascinated by the character of Bert, I can't say no. Well, that's it. I mean, Bert has become the, the ambassador for Tremors. And I did like the fact that you did uh, do a cheeky little reference to both of them in the film. Bert sort of uh, talks about that those characters. So that was nice. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I, yeah, they're, one, they're wonderful. And uh, we do want to play an homage to our own personal history uh, because... The fans have begun to love it, and we—you can't—you can't ignore your history, uh, or your—and <laughs> uh, so, so you know, it's—it's—it's it, it, it's always fun. I dare say this could be the last. Uh, you know, we don't know. Uh, <laughs> I very much doubt it. I very much doubt it. Uh, but uh, that remains to be seen. April fourteenth is now the official Bert Gummer Day, so people have you know every year to celebrate. The achievements and the adventures of Bert. <laughs> you say well, you think April fourteenth is Bert Gummer Day? It's it's written at is the end. Of, for real? At the end of the film in the credits, it says April fourteenth, Bert Gummer Day. I have no idea. Okay, all right. It's <laughs> a real day. Oh my god! All right. You just, you, just gave, you just gave me a bit of information I didn't know, and I like Bert Gummer. Well, how do you know that? Well, I'll be damned. Okay. <laughs> Get ready for the conventions. I shall, I shall observe it from now on. Here on in, it will be observed. 
<laughs> it's in my calendar. Oh, well, I'll leave it there. I'm sure there's others waiting. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been a thrill for me to talk to you. All right. No worries thank whatsoever. Thank you very, very much indeed. And, uh, and uh, blessings and cheers to you. phenomenal song that is that was called trying to sleep by a band called wolf's just fine and it's from an ep called uh perfection nevada if you're paying attention to that song you will have noticed that it was all about tremors from the perspective of graboids which is genius <laughs> and if you dug it then go ahead and look up uh wolf's just fine uh the band because they've done several horror movie related songs before most notably a song for the friday the 13th official video game so I had no idea they existed till I went looking for them, and um, 
Fantastic. I can't song. believe that you had the force that you actually thought that it would exist when you typed into Google Tremors song. I did indeed. <laughs> and what he, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a good one too. But uh, before that was my interview with Michael Gross and I wasn't lying. I am an unabashed Tremors fan and I think Shrieker Island definitely is the best sequel in a long time for that one. So definitely... You know, take invest the money in that one. We do have one up for grabs at the end of the show as well. If you're a cheapskate, and I think he was he was legitimately thrilled to be talking to someone who had seen all of the films and genuinely <laughs> liked them. Like you get the you get the impression that he's talked to a lot of journalists who are like, "Well, I saw the first one." <laughs> <laughs> but did you hear that guy's temperament? I felt like I was talking to Stephen Keaton, not funny yeah. Burt Gummer. <laughs> yeah, he's such a kind of nice, laid back. Uh, yeah, he's a hippie from the hippie from the sixties. He's not into money, man. <laughs> He's, a, he's an art, he's an artiste. Oh, dearie. But um, no, that was heaps of fun. And um, yeah, like I said, go check out Tremors Shrieker Island. And in keeping with the subject, Joe, Chad and James uh, do embrace the Tremors theme. So they're going to present that with a shameless pitch thrown in for good measure. They've got no dignity. That's one, one more from the top, boys. <laughs> Welcome to Bonehead Weekly Fun Size. We're excited that Glenn's got Michael Gross on the show. Chad. Yes, uh, for his uh, <laughs> his stunning performance in not only Tremors, but also his uh, ravishing uh, performance in Night Court where he uh, groped Marky Post. Mr. Gross, if you ever want to come on and do an hour with the Bonehead crew about your appearance on Night Court, we'd love to do that. Actually, we'll talk about other things, but that's where we're going to start at. What we've decided to do for you is not talk about tremors but our favorite movies that have big ass worms in them i'm going now, to go wait, f- real quick do they have to come from that particular part of the body because i picked the wrong worms no no they're not shit weasel big ass worms no 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 just so worms that happen to be large <laughs> creature features that have worms in them let's go with that i'm going to go with ken russell's underrated layer of the white worm if you've never heard of it that's kind of sad but it's not really a particular great movie it does however have a young peter capaldi and hugh grant in it it's based on a brom stoker short story that i've actually never read it was written and directed by ken russell ken russell if you don't know you should know who that is i'm not going to take the time to explain it it's about an estate this worm vampire thing it's anti-religious check it out layer of the white worm it's got some cool visual it's an uneven movie but it's a lot of fun it's from 1988 you know I, I think i'll take your advice from earlier chad and i'll just do the two for of both varieties of sandworms you've got your saturn dwelling sandworms from beetlejuice on saturn yes where they hang out on saturn i don't know why maybe that's where they're native to and, but then and nobody have, ever explains it either in the movie it, it's never even they remotely don't explained they don't I have to i know it, but think about it no it's the experience asks. joe Oh, fuck you. Keep going. <laughs> and then in 1965, we have the earlier sandworms created by Frank Herbert for Dune. And Which the sandworms Dune? are, of course, where you get spice. And Dune, the novel, has been adapted into films three times now. One of it them will be sh- three times, yeah. Yeah, it will be three times. So it uh, would have been four if uh, Jedorowski's Dune would have made it. But anyway... They're also known as the Great Maker, the Maker, Old Father Eternity, or Shalhalud, if you're a big Frank Herbert fan. So there are multiple sandworms. One will get you in the afterlife. One will get you if you go hunting spice. We're not sure how that affects the Spice Girls. Go, Joe. Uh, I'm already Chad. I done wet, but I could no, go we'll again. Try again. No, Let's no, talk no, about no. Ken Russell's layer of the white worm. Try to do I it wanna, better. I want to talk about my most epic worm of all time, even though the sandworms from Beetlejuice come close for a second, I want to talk about Jeff, the giant subway worm from Men in Black 2. <laughs> Jeff, who, I hear you calling. Who gets disrespected <laughs> by Patrick Warburton when he grabs his stem and won't let go, and that just sends Jeff on a, on a rampage, eating all the subways in New York. And how did New York recover from Jeff? I gotta be they honest. never explained that in the movie. How did they fix the subway ch- stations that Jeff just devoured? It isn't explained, people. And that is the biggest injustice of Hollywood. It wasn't about the experience that day, folks. 
I don't even remember that part of the movie. It's Men the in Black beginning 2. of the movie. Men in Black Men 2 in Black is 2. so forgettable. I have no recollection. All I remember is Patrick Warburton crying before he's getting zapped. That's because he just got pulled away by a giant subway worm named Jeff. And You're that's welcome, our fa- Australia. That's our favorite worm films. <laughs> You're oh, how the worm turns. Feel free to come on the show anytime, Mr. Gross. Thank <laughs> you. I don't think we sold ourselves well. I don't <laughs> think we sold ourselves worth a shit. Like I said, they've got no dignity, <laughs> but uh, that was a cool take on today's theme, worm movies. Uh, I'm amazed that Squirm wasn't one of them. Jared's going to be livid. Or worm eaters. Yes. Man, those guys need to lift their game. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. Yes, but from invertebrates to salachets, that's a biological term for sharks. I, I looked that up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I've don't. i never heard that word before. But these aren't just any kinds of sharks. We're talking about Nazi sky sharks, Ben. What the fuck? Yeah, man. This, this movie is totally batshit crazy in the best way possible. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it, it, is, it is all about uh, sky sharks uh, attacking commercial uh, airline, airliners uh piloted by zombies by nazi zombies uh who uh, aren't interested in surrender they don't take prisoners they when you absolutely positively have to kill every motherfucker on the plane uh get yourself some sky sharks some zombie riding sky sharks or zombie ridden sky sharks it is phenomenal it's it's tits and ass and gore and uh, all all over insanity and it has like one of the like i think i do talk about it in the interview but it does have one of the most insane kind of B-grade cast lists of uh-huh. all time. Well, uh, Sky Sharks is one of the most batshit crazy films I've ever seen in my entire life. And this has to be one of the funniest fucking interviews I've ever seen or heard too. So here we go. Hi, Mark. It's, uh, it's great to have you here. Thanks for taking time out to do the, to do the show. Uh, we're here to talk about your latest film, Sky Sharks, which is a kick-ass, over-the-top, insane, nazi exploitation slash bio-horror extravaganza. Uh, can you give us a rundown of what the film is about and where the idea came from? <laughs> Yeah, you know what kind of movies you, I like, you know, that's like, <laughs> it's basically that. Okay, uh, the movie is about one guy who produce uh, super weapons for that government, for that people who really, uh, really pay for it. And that back in the days in Germany, we got a time where we need a lot of super weapons. Uh, it was uh, the Second World War. And uh, the, the main artist, Dr. Richter, built a super machine like a... You make it. You make it possible that like predators, like sharks, can fight and fly and do something like that. And he uses to try to win the war, but it's not happened. And that's why he changed his side and goes to America and make the experiment there. So you see scenes from the Vietnam War. We got super soldiers and monsters. So the movie is about one guy who loved to be someone like you know, compared to Werner von Braun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the movies about sharks and zombies and monsters. But basically, when you see the movie, you see all the history things he put in the back. So it's, it, it looks like a documentary. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah 100%. <laughs> it's based on three events. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, did you know we made, a, we made a documentary about flying sharks? Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, called Shadow of History. Right. It's a 90 minutes documentary about that. What happened in the movie, it's re- it really happened. We talked to really, really known uh, scientists who explained it would be possible to, to bring sky, uh, sharks in the sky. So it's true when you got a, like a, like a, a jet, like a, like a fighter jet, like a, I don't know, they put the skin of a shark on the, on the wings. I like it now. They rebuilt it. But they put the structure of uh, the skin of the sharks on the, uh, on the, on the wings of a, of a plane because it's better to, uh, how do you say this in English? It's better to fly. You got more ergonomy. Aer- aer- aerodynamics. Aerodynamics, I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah, right. So um, it's not so far away the idea that sharks can fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how did you get the idea? I dream it. 
You dream it. It's a dream. <laughs> I, I thought people dream from good looking women and I, I dream of like charm. Like, yeah, yeah. It's soon it's like we, we we did a commercial for a, a German car um, car factory. <laughs> and uh, in the night, I, I don't know why, I dream of like flying sharks and zombies and things like that. We dream. And I told my brother, Carsten, the producer of the movie, he said, Mark, this is totally bullshit. No one will see this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> then in Ken, I go to Jasen, to all the other producers, and everybody say, Mark, this is a great idea. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not my fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> I got just a dream. <laughs> So yeah, this is the, the, the story. So your first film, uh, Mutation, also features the uh, the wonder drug K7B. Yes. Uh, and that film has, has two, two sequels, uh, Mutation 2, Generation Dead, and M3, Century of the Dead, which you didn't do. But right. is, is this movie all set in the same universe? In the same yes. Universe? The, the movie called Before Mutation, and inside Mutation, they work on the super serum K7B. And I released a director's cut of it later that called only K7B. K7B is the, 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 a kind of super liquid, humid, under people uh, back, uh, live back again and they get superpower. Like, well, the Nazis really worked on. And the, the, the movie is from 1999. Right. So, so it's Sky Sharks. You are just my Sky Sharks is based yes. on my first one, <laughs> but the second one and the third one is not my movie because I made uh, the the other actor in the movie called Timo Rose. He made the, the second and the third ones. So, but I'm not involved in that. No, well, did you you just gave him your permission to? Uh... No, that's why we split. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, what what lessons did you learn from making mutation that you were able to, um, you know, translate into into Sky Sharks? <laughs> I made some movies between that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's, a, there's a couple in there. I didn't want to mention the uh, the 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 documentary on uh, funk and soul music, which I'm really keen to see. But it's just so totally outside of the uh, the realm of Sky Sharks. Yeah, it's not that far. We didn't see that. I came from music. Um, I got a record label. I got on tour with Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> I produce bands. Uh, I make um, death metal in the beginning of my career, starting with 14. So I, I, I made 25 years professional music. So that's not that far that Power of Soul is... <laughs> A movie yeah. I really want to do, uh, I, want, I love them, that I made it. Because I got friends also coming from the music scene. And the guy who I made the movie with called uh, DJ Perry. And he's the guy who, he, he, knew, he knew all of this funk and soul legends. So that's why we also met James Bond before he passed away. Right. This wow. was great. And we got a two hours interview on this piano. And they explain how the, where the funk comes from. It comes from the world. Right. Yeah, and things like that. And his wife singing. I see this band's life and things like that. It was crazy. It was crazy. When you come from music, it was honored to be do this. One of the things that I really liked about Sky Sharks was the, was the awesome soundtrack. Yes. It's a bit about putting that together. Like, it really worked well. Like, it's not even... Like, I wouldn't have said it was my kind of music. But through the whole movie, I'm just like, man, this is really pumping like it's really <laughs> great and it works so well with all of the with all of the, the the scenes and stuff like it was really good it looks i love to do you know i came from also do video clips i do commercial i do music i know and i know that sky shark's got parts that looks more like a video clip than than more than like a, a drama or something like that but i like movies like this so yeah you know right. this movie has i think movies have to be entertain you you well, know, Baywatch. <laughs> you see naked people with no guns and slow mo on the beach, yeah. and no one cares. And they say, "This is, you know." So I, mean, I don't know why the people I every mean, say, oh, "Mark, you put like a video clip together." Yeah, you better not. People love to see MTV or things like that. So <laughs> why not? Well, I was going to say, like, your movie contains a boatload of uh, violence, uh, awesome kills, and gore and a boatload of nudity, is it worthwhile making a horror film? Like, is it worth even watching a horror film without those two things in it? 
<laughs> it's like, you know, I think you're the same age. I'm, I'm, I'm old school. I'm, I love movies from the 80s. Yeah, they all have the, they all have those things in it. Like they've all... You're right. All, That's why I put it in. And you yeah. see when people in our age see Skyshock, they love it. And people in younger age, they hate it. Because yeah. it's like when you grow up with movie, uh, when you got the possibility to go to X Hamster, you pour and all the shit, you got not a problem to see uh, good looking girls. You know, in our age, <laughs> we have yeah. to fight for a small porno and things like that. And oh, you got a new porno. And you see naked girls. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, that's. And you see all the violent things. What I mean is like, Man Eater was not allowed in Germany. Zombie is banned. So it was the magic around all the things. Yeah. And this is. That's why we. That's why I'm starting doing movies or collecting movies or releasing movies. It's the magic, and this is what I put in in Sky Shark, You know, yeah. and that's why I mean it's so funny. People in our age loved it, and the young kids say, "Hey, man, what the fuck is old school?" And the older girls are naked. I say, "Yes, yeah, great." Huh? Oh no! So that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. The yeah. movies for older people. <laughs> You, I don't care, but this is this is what you want to I, I what you want to do. And yeah. I love the idea. You see a naked girl. You you sit in the plane, and a naked girl with black uh, runs through you <laughs> to, to the whole plane. <laughs> what the fuck? I love these ideas. So yeah. yeah, so good, so good. Like, and you've you've managed to assemble like an international cast of uh, of actors, including people like uh, Tony Todd from Candyman, uh, Kerry. Hiroyuki Tagawa, my favorite from Showdown in Little Tokyo, and yeah. you mentioned Baywatch. Like he's the guy that kills Mitch's wife in Baywatch. He's amazing. Yes, uh, Amanda <laughs> Bears from Fright Night, Dave Sheridan from Scary Movie, uh, Eva Haberman from Lex, La Park Lincoln from House Two and Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven. Uh, you got Karando Mitsutaki and Asami from Gun Woman in there. Mick Garris yes. pops up. Lynn Lowry yeah. from The Crazies and Shivers. <laughs> okay, this is an amazing cast. How did you how did you get all these people in your film? I asked them. <laughs> <laughs> That's that true. is true. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, I still ask. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark. I do movie with like shots. And they say, fuck you. They yeah. say, I have somebody. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just true. I don't, I don't ask the management. I really go to the to themselves in person and I tell them what I want to do. And I said, hey, you only need like uh, maybe one day. How much money you want to have? You say, oh, one day. It's like when people come to Germany, there's a convention or things like that. I go there and ask them. And you ask them. They like it. It was great casting. You had um, Kerry uh, uh, Hiroyuki Tagawa playing like a, a cowboy, which was yes, which was amazing. I After watching him in the film, I was like, surely he's dubbed. Like you dubbed his voice. But then I went and listened to a couple of interviews with him because he always, in everything I've ever seen him in before, he's always like, like he's got a really kind of- Yeah, yeah, he's from Texas. Raspy voice. And then when you listen to him, normal talk normal, he's like, he's a, 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 you know, super American. Like, yeah, he lives in America, he lives in Texas. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but I never know. I got the same. And when we met us in, uh, at, the, at the set and he starts, uh, uh, showed me the lines. I said, "Yeah, you speak very Texanish in German. And you speak like a Texan American guy." Yeah, right. Oh, I'm from yeah. Texas. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, <laughs> you from Texas? I thought you were a street fight. <laughs> 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 and the thing is, what we want to do, or what we did in Skyshark, is we gave every actor the one role. Yeah, <laughs> it's been like uh, you know, you see. Uh, Robert Lazado playing like a priest. Yeah, <laughs> which is a great bit and, of comedy. And after that, he, he came to me and hugged me and said, Mark, you're the first one who see my my real talent. That I can play <laughs> other things like a, like a bad guy. Yeah, because he's always playing yes. like, like gang members or serial killers or yeah, yeah. something like that. And he's just and a, that's my little Laurie. She's the playmate. She plays a nun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You had Japanese, uh, uh, Asian looking guy who plays a text, uh, like a Western guy. A Western guy, you yeah. know. 
I mean, you had uh, what Lucy Cat though. Lucy Cat, you had uh, who's a porn star. You oh, had her yeah. play a porn star. Like, oh no, sure. No, oh, yes, 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 yes. She's a scientist who just happens to be having sex when you <laughs> when you cut to her before she gets eaten by a shark. Which is like, it's my my favorite my favorite sequence of the film is that stuff involving her with the <laughs> with the head cam camera and she's having the <laughs> sex and then the Nazi cuts off the guy's head and sticks yeah. his head over the stump. <laughs> <laughs> it was this yes. amazing sequence like I, I, thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed it it was really good hey i love i love that you really talk about this scene i really love it too yeah. you got, <laughs> because it's like you got lucy cat and she comes no the blood you no know, it comes yeah. <laughs> and she scream wake up and see you know his uh the guy who fucked her is like a zombie now. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> this was a great orgasm. The same with the people in the who were joined the Mile High Club and are having sex in the airplane before. Uh, yes. The and that was a great bit of practical effects when the the periscope comes down and crushes his yes. head and he was, he was looking out of his. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> we show, we show how smart the Nazis are. Cut him in his head. You can't see anything. Hey, told me bloody. I can't see anything. Yeah, you're a German idiot. <laughs> <laughs> the film, the film is a special effects like extravaganza. I've used that word too many times in this interview already but it's it's a true i can't think of a better word to describe it and the attention to detail in every frame like from like michaela schaefer being on the as like conan riding a giant <laughs> frog on the video game yes and like all that stuff like it's amazing did you know did you know that you were going to do all that when you were filming it or did you come up with that in post and just kind of added it in as you went along like like how did you <laughs> <laughs> come up with that stuff yeah. amazing <laughs> the craziest thing i have to do it was like we got we start the movie in 90 uh, 90 in 2014 and i got a partner uh, he was a 3d artist and he got his own company and i called him i said hey nico i got a deal we can do it sky sharks but i need you for the special effects mark no problem huh? this mark no problem <laughs> <laughs> so after one year his company was corrupt and he was good so <laughs> <laughs> okay i said shit then uh, I, I tried to get another uh, uh cgi company because i know because i have to do the movie i do all this uh design on this uh, the production design i do i do the movie thing uh, the music and all the shit and i say i don't want to do all sorts of special effects <laughs> i don't want to do it <laughs> so that's why i'm looking for another company okay we got another company mark no problem we make everything after one year they quit <laughs> and i stand there again no, <laughs> with the effects and then i start to do with another guy and there are two guys doing all the effects in the movie yeah, right. 1,500 effects. Wow. So, oh my God. Yeah, right. It's a, I mean, like, there's, there's, I don't think there's a, there's a frame in the film that doesn't have something awesome going on somewhere in it. Only one. That's, there's just a frame with my dick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, you, fight uh, club. Yeah, <laughs> you uh, crowdfunded uh, this film. You got part of the budget through crowdfunding. Part of the budget. You exceeded your seventy-five thousand euro goal uh, by quite a bit, I believe, like twenty thousand euros or something more than you uh, set out to to get. We we made one hundred and nine thousand euros. Wow! At Kickstarter. Kickstarter. So, yeah. and do, you think, do you think that? crowdfunding is like now an, an integral part of truly independent filmmaking yes yes yes, yes. and I, I really like it because people from from the outside can invest in your idea or not so you make a promotion you know and you know kickstart yeah you make a video and say hey la, la, la. and i think it's a surreal fair part so you can buy a dvd okay you're not really lose something you get a dvd of a crappy movie or a good one so but you can be uh, uh, like in the end of a movie, yeah, you know the credits of the movie. This is great when you when you really uh, filmify and when you really love films. This is great to be a part of something. 
and, and the Kickstarter guys uh, who really wants to be inside the movie, so they pay a lot of money to come uh, to our sets and sit there. And you see the second planetary. All of them are Kickstarters, and they're really happy that I cut off the head. <laughs> 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 and, hey, Mark, I want to die. I say, yeah, no problem. I want to kill you today. Which is one, uh, of, the best, one of the best mass death scenes since, <laughs> since Death Ship. Like that, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. You know, I love Death Chip, and this is a, a kind of homage on it. But yeah. I love to do it with charts. <laughs> and I really awesome. like the idea that you got the kind of pirates in the sky and coming and, boom, and you see on this steel rope. Yes. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> and so everywhere we, you know, you are the one you, you you saw all the small things we put everywhere. Yeah, like it was like yeah. it, it, I mean the film is like yeah it's just such a great kind of homage to to everything that I love about uh, horror films. So it was yes. uh, it was super um super awesome to um to watch. Now, do you have do you have any advice uh for uh, aspiring filmmakers on how to run a successful crowdfunding campaign? You have to be really behind that what you want to do. If you I think the people see when you're not really do a good personal uh, like a promotion video of the idea you got the people see that you're not really want to do it maybe ah, i want to do like a movie give me money you have to be really honest you have to be really straight behind the idea and you have to you know, you have to go to the limit like me i know i'm not that one when to say go crazy like me look at me i got beer i'm old now <laughs> but crowdfunding is a really really great thing and you have to be fair to the to your bakers, to your supporters. Then they will be fair to you, and they give you the money. Filmmaking is, you know, it's like war, but without people dying normally. So you have to really <laughs> fight for that. <laughs> you have to be really behind all the action you want to do, and you have to you have to love what you want to do. I do. Oh, yes. Before we go, what what's next? What's next for you and your brother? Sky frogs. <laughs> <laughs> We got a problem. We got lockdown, so we do a lot of audiobooks now. Okay. Uh, we got an audiobook label since 2009. We're releasing a lot of audiobooks, radio plays, and things like that. Um, we're working on. Uh, we made a new script, but it's a thriller, not not with Nazi sharks. No, <laughs> it's like just a thriller and some mystic elements. Yeah, <laughs> some. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more. Yeah. I hope it still contains uh, as much nudity, like even yeah, yeah. thrillers. Thrillers traditionally have a lot of nudity in them as well. Like, yeah, know. you know, yeah. that's why I'm doing it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I work, you know, I work on the label. Yeah, now that yeah, there, there's some things. Your your um your Anthropophagus release looks looks absolutely amazing. Where can you just uh, give us a plug? Can you check if uh, I got uh, uh, one for you? I <laughs> <laughs> would love, love it. But could you uh, do you want to just give out a quick plug? Uh, for your uh, website where people can see all of the awesome stuff that you're putting together? Yeah, this is uh, www.sinestrange-extreme.com or DE. Oh, DE. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, this is the shop. You go and you see all the shop, you see all the product you got. It was so great to talk to you. We talk later, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs> okay, Thanks, bye. bye. Well, Firstly, man, exceptional interview. Not only was he incredibly entertaining, but you absolutely nailed that one. Thank Incredible. you. I, like, uh, it was helped that I, I really enjoyed the film, I think. <laughs> yeah, it does help. It always helps. <laughs> <laughs> but secondly, Sky Frogs. Mate, this Sky has to frogs. happen. Well, yeah. <laughs> I would totally love to see Sky Frogs. And there's like, because there's a little, there is a bit of a, and I do mention it in the interview, there is a bit of a nod to it at the start because the film opens on this young girl and her grandfather on a, a like a sitting next to each other on an airplane. And the girl is kind of looking out the window and she keeps talking to her granddad who is, or yeah, I think it's his granddad. It could be her father, but I think it's her grandfather. But he's busy on his on the on his entertainment system is watching Michaela Shaver, who is like a, a kind of a page three type model, who's dressed <laughs> as kind of a a, a, a red Sonia type character, yep. but with the topless, and she's riding on a giant frog through kind of the Amazon, hacking uh -huh. people's heads off and stuff. And you're like, 
is this is this what Sky Sharks is this what uh, Sky Frogs is going to be? Because I cannot wait. And everybody that does watch Sky Sharks must watch it through the credits because there is more Sky Frogs at the end, and yeah. I was absolutely <laughs> frothing it. It's fantastic. Uh, but anyway, dude, cheers again. Outstanding work. Um, and that brings us to our final recommendation from Adam for the year. Hey guys, it's Adam here from Adam's Just Seen with my final Good Movie Monday recommendation for the year. Now, I was tossing up what I was going to go with for this final recommendation, but I've got to be true to myself and go with a film that I saw this week, a film that is definitely going to be in my top five movies of this year, and that movie is The Sound of Metal, written and directed by Darius Marder. Now, I've always believed that movies are 50-50, that they're 50% visual and 50% audio and this movie has probably got the most insane and incredible sound design that I have seen in a recent movie. Um, what we are following here is a heavy metal drummer played by Riz Ahmed in a career best performance. I mean Riz has been incredible in so many movies and so versatile but he has never been better than he is here as Reuben Stone, a heavy metal drummer who is rapidly losing his hearing and has to adjust to a new world. Um, this film, I guess from the outset, it looks like you know where you are, where this is going, but this touches on so many different kind of human elements from addiction to recovery to community to acceptance uh, to fate and it really is, to me, an emotional slam dunk. What surprised me about this film is that it is a slightly co-written story by credit by Derek Sanfrance, and I have reviewed some of Derek's movies here on Good Movie Monday, including The Place Beyond the Pines, and he seems to just, I don't know, for me, it, some people could maybe think that it's melodramatic or that it's very heavy, but he manages to get you to this emotional place that I just don't think that many artists are doing in modern movies, and The Sound of Metal took me to that place and just, you know, movies like this that really st stick with me and emotionally scar me, that's what I am all about. I want that journey. And so I was very happy to find this movie right near the end of the year. Um, yeah, I just, I don't think I could just go on about... Th the main elements about this really are the sound design and Riz. And I think that that is going to make this an iconic, enduring movie that will, people will come and revisit. You can catch this on Amazon Prime and you can also see it on limited theatrical release at the moment. Obviously, my preference is going to be for you to go to the movies and go and check it out. So my nickname has been Adam Five Star Ross, and I'm going to give The Sound of Metal five stars, a new modern classic. Check it out ASAP. Damn it. Uh, I, was, I was banking on Adam reviewing Mank this week because I really wanted to throw in a few, a few words about it. Um, so I may as well. Have you watched Mank yet? <laughs> David Fincher's no. new film. Oh, no. tell you what, watch it. It's incredible. I think it's one of his best films. I gave it five stars on Screen Realm. It's incredible. Right. So we are just about done. Um, but before we do wrap things up, Ben, uh, we've got some relevant movies to give away. And you would be an idiot to not want a copy of Sky Sharks. Uh, so if you are a cheapskate and want to have a crack at a free copy, then we have one up for grabs from Umbrella Entertainment. We also have a free copy of Tremors, Shrieker Island up for grabs. We're going to chuck that at you as well, thanks to Universal Pictures. And as if that's not enough, uh, we're going to make this a special second-to-last episode bundle. So we're going to include a copy of The Soul Collector, a new release from Eagle, and another free pass to the Lunar Drive-In. So that is a prize pool value of 120 bucks, And winning it could not be easier. Just be the first person to email us the answer to this question. Which American, Canadian, or tour filmmaker directed the 2018 feature-length pilot episode for the failed Tremors reboot starring Kevin Bacon? Now, if you didn't catch all that, rewind it. It's a podcast. Uh, from this point on, we're going to be directing all answers to our alternative email address, which is contact at fakeshemp.net. So don't go sending them to my personal one anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> No, save that. For, save that for dick pics and uh, and hate mail. Uh, so anyway, right now in this very moment, if you're listening on Monday morning, email your answer to that question, and uh, there's a damn good chance you're going to score some stuff. And because I'm in a good mood, and I, as we said, it's our second to last episode, we might even throw in uh, some runner up prizes for the uh, the runner up two guesses. Uh, ben, that's it. We've reached the end, mate. Fantastic. One thing I wanted to mention before we uh, before we fly is that Bill and Ted Face the Music was released last week to Home Entertainment, and I've already watched it twice. It's great. Have you caught I it? Watched it? I haven't watched it once, which is odd because I do love the I love both the Bill and Ted franchise and Samara Weaving. 
I freaking uh, adored this one, and it was even better the second time around. And what a fantastic conclusion to the series. It's 30 years worth the wait, as far as I'm concerned. And the only reason that I mention it right now is because we are going to sign off with a song from the soundtrack. <laughs> So, thank you to our regular cohorts, Jarrett from Monster Pictures, Guillermo from Screen Realm, Adam from Adam's Just Seen, and Joe, Chad, and James from Bonehead Weekly. Go find them all online and throw them a like. Thanks to you, Ben. Unreal job with that interview, mate. Thank you very Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. I was <laughs> unsure about how it would go before I did it. And, um, and thanks to everybody for listening. And uh, we have a big, uh, no, a massive, in fact, a gigantic final episode for you next week. And we're going to be celebrating Christmas with a good movie Monday gangbang. <laughs> You're going to have to tune in to understand the context behind that one. <laughs> but uh, we, we can promise you it will be a colossal show. And um, we have all nine of us together for one big final bash. And uh, best of all is the entire show will be presented on video for the first time. So uh, put that in your diary next Monday. Cannot wait to see the air out with an all-in nerdgasm. Um, but for now, as promised, a killer tune from the Bill & Ted 3 soundtrack. It is the beginning of the end by Weezer. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next Monday. Knocking on my door, they tell me it's time to go on. Last check in the mirror to see if anything's wrong. The writing's up on the wall. Warning shot to them all My head is spinning It's the beginning of the end The people freak out when I walk out Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog.